Praise the Lord. I am Thomas Manton IV, God's servant. He's prophet to the nations and a mentor and a coach to many, a success strategist. Why? Because God's given me so many insights on how people can begin to succeed if they apply themselves. I'm going to speak about some very weighty uh, formulas today for divine abundance. I want to call this, entitle this, Divine Formulas for Financial Abundance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace, your fire, your wisdom, your anointing. Let it come forth as strong as I've been feeling it all morning. <laughs> Let me say everything you want me to say. Think through my mind, speak through my lips as your anointed pen of a ready writer. I want to I wanna speak as your, as your voice, you speaking to your people. You know, the days are far spent for, for people to fool around with life. The days are far spent for us to see men in their folly, even in the ministry, even in the church world. We don't need to see people. We need to see God in action. The, the man always has a personality, always has a special, you know, flair and uniqueness about them. God made it that way, and that's very exciting. It's very entertaining. It's very brilliant. If you see someone that kind of blends in with everybody and they kind of look like everybody else, even if they, you know, they're of a certain ethnic group or whatever, I, I, don't, I don't see that as being God's power being exhibited through somebody. Somebody said we're not called to impress, we're called to express. We're not called to be an impression, make an impression. We're called to be the expression of God. So if there's not something that unique coming through you, hey, it's time to grow up. I don't want to like harp on this too much, you know, the harp. And, uh, but, but I just want to challenge people, come up higher. It's time to come up higher. I wrote something in a, a post I did on social media uh, late last night or this morning. You know, the days and hours all flow together for me. I don't, I don't know. I wrote something when someone said, I like this quote, and I posted it. I like it, I like it, I like it. When you put everything in God's hands, you'll see soon God's hand in everything. But you know what? And I wrote on the top a real rebuke. Don't think that you don't have to do anything because God's not into laziness. Number one formula for divine success, diligence. I want you to write that down somewhere. Diligence is number one. Also, passion, I could say a number two. Diligence, number one. But you have to know what you're going to be diligent in. So maybe there's one before that. I'm not going to say these in any, any sequential, sequential order, really, but by the Holy Ghost. Uh, and I, I, I looked at this statement. The great achiever is one who is obsessed with his dream and his goal. If you're not passionate and full of like what to do and you're diligent about it that's why I put diligence as number one then where are you going to get in life and a scriptural reference for this I saw Nehemiah the great book of Nehemiah Nehemiah got burdened about a destroyed place long story you know the story you can read the whole book of Nehemiah but there's a key verse starting from the 17th verse of the second chapter that said something so powerful. He said, you see the distress that we're in, how the places lay waste. He named the city, but let, let's talk about, let's just talk about even your life. All right, never, ne never mind just all the external things. How about the internal, your internal world, your own life? And he said, the gates are burned with fire. Come on, that's adversity. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is real, but I think it could also be symbolic of, you know, your life also. And he said, 
come and let us build the walls back up again. I'm paraphrasing because I don't want it. We think about, oh, it's about Jerusalem. And that was a time thousands of years ago. And there was adversaries there. And then Nehemiah rose up and did this. If you start doing that with the Bible, you delude yourself. I want to rebuke this, this religious uh, quasi whatever, you know, pseudo, you know, use those words, kind of like fake. It's, it's putting the fake on the real. You psych yourself out, uh, out, out of something, out of a principle that God gave here, because you, you, you refer it only to the place of reference, which was back then. Nehemiah is long gone. I trust I'll meet him one day because I respect him because he got passionate about a vision to do something. So I, don't, I wouldn't mind meeting him and talking with him and saying, how did you feel? Where did you get started? What was the day that you looked at things and got stirred up? What did God show you? How did it work? I would ask questions like that. But the fact of the matter is that Nehemiah is nowhere around us to, 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 to today. And if you go back like a few verses back, like uh, 12th verse, 13th verse, the refuse gate, there's the fountain gate, the king's pool, and all of these places, and then the, the valley gate, and then the what? Come on, where is this today? And the Jews, and the priests, and the nobles, and the officials, and the others who did the work. They, they were there, but God, God wants to give us our own, work with our own gates today. I think, you know, I've heard teachings on this, and I don't have time to go through it, although I could, if I wanted to do a little seminar on this. What, what's the reference and meaning of all the gates? You know, there's actually a meaning of those. And we did teachings in this and had, saw seminars and all that with people that had time back then, like in the 1980s, the 1990s. Okay, not even 2000. By 2000, by 2000, I was gone. I was gone, gone, gone. G-O-N-E, all in caps. I was going, I started to go all over the planet. Uh, so when I had time... You know, in America, to be like in these seminars and conventions and uh, not really convention, but what would you call it? Like a, a series of meetings, like a seminar kind of theme. And you spend a few days in this conference center and you go through the teaching and you're there and you, you're on the local front, you know. But then the day comes when you don't have any more time. And God started to send me when I went. In, uh, in 1997 to Jerusalem, that began it there, and, and, and the Lord gave me a worldwide ministry, and we birthed it, we, we established it, we dedicated it, I did, in Jerusalem, Israel. In February, the first week of February 1997, with my dear friend Dr. Mike Murdoch, I was there with him in Jerusalem for the whole 10 days, we were there for 10 days, and... Uh, I have pictures of that. I'm gonna. I'll put them on. Post them on my website and social media. I found some treasured uh, photos with me and him standing. One standing in front of Peter's, but one of Peter's fishing fishing boats. The real one. You know, they they preserved it. They shellacked it. They preserved it. Put the stuff on it and sat it there as a monument. One of Peter's fishing boats. The real one. How you say in Africa, in Kenya, Maasai. The really one. The really one, it's really there. And then him and me standing with the Israeli Star of David flag flying behind us on the Sea of Galilee. And we had a great time there. But that, that you know, aside from my being with him, the Lord visited me there. And then, God, you see, God can go away. I don't know what people think of this sometimes, but I don't care. I want to teach the church about how to, how to experience the visitation of God. You could go to a church, you know, and speak, and, and it's great. You could share so many deep things that they don't even, you know, quite catch it, or it might scare the children. It might scare them a bit. Like when I tell the story of how Jesus Christ appeared to me. You know, if I feel led to, to say that statement, you know, I'm going to say it. And they think, whoa, oh, maybe can everyone have that experience? I don't know. That's not my business. You know, I was thinking about what somebody's doing this morning, and then I started to laugh. You know, one person, I was thinking about something, and I started to laugh, and I said, 
It's not my business. I'm not going to dwell too much on it. Great thought, but let's move on. And while all that was going on, fellowship with him, we went shopping together. He brought his father. His father was there. We went down to Via Dolorosa. We walked together down there and prayed together down there. We, we went to the kibbutzes, you know. We went to eat fish and we, all these places there. And we went shopping, you know, for briefcases and stuff down there. But then when I got back to the hotel every night, the Lord visited me, and it was beyond everybody that was there. Lester Sumrall's organization, the great apostle, was also the... Uh, was the organizer of that trip. And I have photographs of me. I, got, I went to do the baptism in the Jordan River, and you know, my hair and my beard flowing in the water and the white robe, but they say, people say, boy, this really looks like Jesus himself coming out of the water. It's, it's, if I could post that photo again, it's really great. I just, somebody just came up to me yesterday in a conference. I just spent two, uh, two, two days ago. I just spent two days this week with... Uh, one of the greatest apostles alive in our generation, Dr. Paul Inenshi. And he has built uh, single-handedly, the, well, with the help of a lot of people, he has built the largest church facility on planet Earth that's erected and uh, active today, being used today. It's an indoor church arena with a gold dome on the top that's the gold dome roof cost millions upon millions of dollars and they built it debt free, cash money. Money came from everywhere. And the gold dome roof is 293 meters across. A football field is about 90 meters. So that's like three football fields. They put it up, they found a way, him and Dr. David Oyedipo, his father in the Lord, See, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. I want to get into this. The spiritual connection that you have, you know, will, will take you somewhere. So you want to be with people that really have been with God. That's a big help. That's a key to financial breakthrough, you know. And I'm going to share some other things. Tithing is a key to financial breakthrough. By the way, I'll just say this before I get into it a bit more. If you're not a tither, God will not, he has no obligation to flood your life with money. <laughs> it's a starting of revelation. I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak this to me yesterday. He said to me, so it's, I was standing right over here, uh, to the left of where I'm looking at you, in this other room over here, I was standing there. And the Lord showed me so clearly and spoke to me. I thought, well, that clears up a lot of things, doesn't it? We also know that uh, the, scriptures, the Scriptures clear on it. Hebrews 7 is a New Testament example about the tithe. The story of Melchizedek, the high priest who was receiving from Abraham, who was likened unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says Melchizedek had no mother or father. So who was it? It was, it was a symbolic... Uh, type of the high, uh, you know, of, uh, manifestation of the high priest, Jesus Christ himself. And then we see Malachi, that's two witnesses, and then we see Malachi 3, uh, verses 10 to 8 to 12. You robbed me, this whole nation, in what? Tithes and offerings. They said, how have we robbed you? Tithes and offerings. And then he said, now bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there'll be meat in my house, and prove me now here with say the Lord of hosts, and see if I'll not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour you, you out a blessing that there's not even room enough to receive it, and then I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake, and then you'll become even a delightsome land for me, says the Lord of hosts. So, he said, because you robbed me, and from verse 8 and 9 in Malachi 3, you're cursed with a curse. In other words, there's a curse added to the financial life of a non-tither. That's, that's, that's just verbatim scripture. So if you want to get blessed financially, Someone said, do I need to tithe? If you want to get blessed, if you want God to favor you and give you a lot of money, yes, you do. Because if you, if you don't, <laughs> he'll say you haven't even obeyed the, the principle that I gave you to live by. That's a formula for financial success and financial abundance. So where was I? Israel. So in the night, 
after the day of touring all the great places, the Pool of Bethesda, the Garden Tomb, the Upper Room, which I led a prayer service at, the Jordan River, Caiaphas' house, the Sea of Galilee, uh, uh, the, the Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus preached the hill that goes down to the water. All these places we went to were just phenomenal. We drove by the, the border of Jordan, and uh, you see over there, and they, they told us, they said, you know, you can't walk across this uh, little dirt path here. He said, I, on the other side of that, is, it's, it's, it's lined with landmines. If you step on it, you'll, you'll be blown into the next, the next life, Whether, wherever, if it's good or bad for you. And he said, if you step across this line, there's surveillance from the air. Within seconds, fighter jets will be flying above your head or helicopters, whatever, military, will come and be like talking to you, like, go back. Uh, and you look around, you don't see anything. It looks like a big open desert. But they said, you don't know how rigged this place is. I'm like, Jesus, this is a bit, this is a bit, this is a bit advanced. So after all that, I got back and the Holy Spirit just came over me. And I went into a trance every single night I was there. And then I missed the dinner with all the people. And then uh, I, I got up about two hours later. It was like after 8 o'clock. Dinner was at 6 or 6.30. Or by 7, the latest, you know, and then by 8.30, quarter to 9, sometimes 9 o'clock, sometimes after. I was, I was suspended in the spirit seeing visions and God was anointing me for the worldwide ministry. More so than before. In Jerusalem, at the King David Hotel is where we stayed. That's where I was. So I came out, I thought, wow, everybody's gone. Looks like the restaurant's closed. And here come these Israelites running out, these Israeli people, they run out. And they're like, hey, sir, hi. Wow, and I'm beaming like the noonday sun. They're looking at me. They were bowing their heads. These are Jews, okay? And they were bowing their heads. And they were like, we see that uh, you're, you're a very important man. That's what they said, things like that, very honoring. They said, uh, and we noticed you, didn't, you weren't here for the dinner. Do you want to eat something? Would you like some food? I said, absolutely. Then they said, sit over here. They put me at this beautiful table. They came and decorated, put candles and lights on it, whatever. And they began to bring plates of food. What do you want? And they filled the whole table. I sat there and just had my own like buffet f table full of food and ate till I was content. I mean, it was, it was amazing. So how, how did that happen? Based on the call of God. I reference back to that because I'm living in that today and I've never left it. You have to decide. Here's another formula for financial abundance, for, for the blessing of the Lord, is to be persevering no matter what you see and stay with the vision. I must, here's a statement, I must stay with the vision of God. I must never, ever let it leave my eyesight. I must never let it leave my heart and my mind and my imagination. Every single hour of every single day, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 30 or 31 days a month, 365 days a year, and 366 days on the, every fourth year, the February 29th or whatever day they make the leap year, it's like it never leaves you. On the Gregorian calendar, Gregorian calendar on the, what are the Babylonian time system that they made, whatever it is, this clock that runs, you know, around the watch and goes shh, like this way, clockwise, around like this. It's like it's beating within your heart just like your watch is ticking here. And it never stops. If you do that, God will come and back you up. I love Hebrews 6.10. Let's look at that. Hebrews 6.10 says, your, your, your labor of love is immense. You never stop, and therefore I'm not unjust to forget it, and I'll bless you for it. That's what the Lord said. I'm paraphrasing, but you could, we could read it on the screen. I'll never forget you because you never forget me. Remember the statement when I put everything in God's hands, meaning my life, more importantly, then his hand will be working in my life. My hands are with him, his hands are with me. A lot of people don't do that. You think, some people think, well, because I'm a Christian, it's kind of obvious because I've confessed the faith. No, but your life is not like that. 
You don't think about God. You don't serve God. Serving God is what? Doing his will, what he wants. And 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, when you ask according to his will, something that he's ordained for you, and you get in the flow of that, he'll grant, he'll grant it to you, you the answer, the, the petitions you're asking for, and even abundance. Serving God will bring you into prosperity. It almost sounds like the formula for this. It almost sounds like a natural thing, a carnal thing. So you mean I'm, I'm going to have pleasures, right? God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his, ser of his servant. That's me. If you're a servant of God, that's you. Psalm 35, 27. They that favor my righteous cause, David said, this was David talking, meaning the righteous cause that God gave me, if you favor this, God will bless you. You know, he said, let the Lord be magnified. In other words, let his voice be amplified. Let him have his will in his way throughout the entire world. And let it never stop. Beating like your heart is beating, like your blood is coursing through your veins. The circulation, it never stops. It never stops. Someone said, that's... That's pretty radical. That's pretty out there. Do people live like that? No, most people don't. That's why they're all messed up. And then at the end of the day, as we'd say, the end of the road of life, are we going to hear, well done, you did well? Or just like, mm. okay, by my mercy, yeah, you've confessed to me enough. I, I see that you're, you're saved, uh, so to speak, by my blood and covenant. So yeah, go ahead, go. Go, go, go in, go in, go in. Come in, come in, sorry. I don't want to hear that, do you? I just did okay. No, I don't want to just do okay. Let me tell you something else. The best days are ahead. Why? Because we've been prepared through a long process for greater things. The greater things is always the greater thing. How, here's, a key, here's another key, another formula for, for breakthrough and blessing. How hungry are you for revival, for God's plan, for God's purpose, for God's action plan? How hungry are you for it? How much do you want it? How much do you want it? I'm flipping through this. Uh, I really like this. I want to make one of these for myself. For our ministry. I'm reading. The great achiever trusts God during seasons of setbacks. Psalm 56, 11. In God I put my trust. I'll not be afraid of anything. I like it. The great achiever encourages those around him to reach for something greater. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we'll reap if we faint not. The great achiever always celebrates the success of those who went before him. That's true. You, you, ha you have to celebrate somebody. The great achiever knows when to speak and when to not speak. Etc. So, this wraparound effect, I want to call it, of the vision of God. Somebody lift your hands to the Lord and say, God, please wrap your arms around me. Wrap your power around me. That I could see everything you want me to see. I'll, I'll be everything you want me to be. I'll do everything you want me to do. I'll become well, who you want me to become. And I'll do all that you want. All your will, all your desire, I'll do it. It's too rare in our day. Nehemiah was a strange cat. Even those two dogs, I'll call them umbos, those two animals, Sambalad and Tobiah, if they're in heaven, I think we, we, I don't know how we read the scripture. Two devils. The Ammonite official and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, and they laughed at us. So there was a few of them. There's Sambalad, there was Tobiah, the the. the Sambala was a what? A Horonite? A Horonite. A Hor... That's a not good. Horonite. 
kind of word is that? Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem. No one ever talks about Geshem, the Arab. <laughs> three idiots. That is not even two, it is three. They laughed at us and despised us. What is this thing you think you're doing? Can you rebel against the king? The king, the king had his thing set up and Nehemiah caught another vision. Where did he get it from? From heaven. You can see people around you, how they are, how things go on in societies and cultures, and you're going to be one like Joshua and Caleb who has another spirit, a different spirit than the others. There were 12 captains, leaders of the tribes, and Joshua and Caleb were two out of the 12 that, that were different than the others. All the other 10 were conformists. This one said, Nehemiah, can you, you think you, you can rebel against the king? You won't conform with the system that was put in place? How do you like the three Hebrew boys, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? They said, the God of heaven himself, like Nehemiah said, the God of heaven himself will prosper us and will arise and build. Why? Because he had a vision. And the three Hebrew boys were thrown into the fiery furnace, but before that he says, you know, the Lord will deliver us himself. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow to you, you fool. We're not going to bow to you, you evil thing. If we do, it's like we're negating our faith. And guess what? They went into the fire, and they, they looked, and they could see a fourth one in there, likened to the Son of God. Who is that? Amazing. And they didn't get burned at all. And the people that they made the fire, uh, you know, you know the story, the fiery furnace, the fire, can you imagine fire like that? They made it seven, they, I don't know how they made it seven, they figured out it was seven times, but seven times is a lot, seven times hotter. Even people that got too close to it went on fire and burnt, but they were thrown in the middle of it and they didn't get touched by anything of it. Why? Because the vision of God consumed them. Are you seeing this? People say, I want breakthrough, I want to be blessed, I want to be, I want to be well, I want to be... How hungry are you for the plan of God? Dr. Paul Inetje, I think I, I want to rebroadcast this on my channel. His message uh, Friday morning. Thursday morning was good too, maybe the both, of them, both of those. The night services were like miracle healing crusades bit different, you know. But he did speak a word on the way out about divine judgment accompanies revival. I've, you know, I've been saying that. It confirmed a lot of things I've been saying about judgment. God has to judge people for three reasons. Number one, he's going to clean the atmosphere from their evil influence. Number two, he's going to save the lives of other people from being affected by them, evildoers. Number three, it's just punishment for what they did. And the scripture came up. I'm going to find the scripture. I don't have it in front of me right now. But it's just coming to my mind right now to, to, to mention this. There's a scripture that says that it's the good thing for them to be destroyed because of their evil. Just because it's punishment for them. That's a scripture. If I can find it, uh, we'll put it on the screen here maybe on this very message later. This is live, but we'll go through this and, you know, do a reshoot from the, from the camera version. And I want to put some scriptures on the screen. We'll do it later. And uh, I'm going to find that scripture that talks about, it's, it's so clear in the scripture. You know what? When you have the word of God, let me say something else. The divine formula for financial abundance, for blessing, for empowerment in life, is the holy scripture. When you have the word... <laughs> Yes, Lord. When you have the word of the living God right here from here, who, who do you have to confer with? I love what Paul said. He says, when I heard the Apostle Paul, great Apostle Paul, said, when I heard from the Holy Ghost, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. He also wrote this great verse in Galatians 4.1. <laughs> he said, you are actually Lord of all, but you differ than nothing, you differ, you differ nothing than but from a child because you don't realize it. 
though you be Lord of all, an heir to the king, your, your royalty, but, you, be, but because you don't see it in your mind, and your spirit, you know what, when you get full of the Holy Ghost, you begin to see yourself. I, I want to say something else. Humility is very important. It doesn't mean you see yourself as a giant, and then I have to dress myself up in a, in a king's robe, and everybody has to bow down to me, and I walk around like I'm so important. Are you kidding? So the, the element of elevation comes from your honor of humility. You must know that a certificate of elevation and promotion comes from your honor of humility. Humility is a key to breakthrough. If you're not humble, humility, we might call it being down to earth. If you, if you, uh, you don't see yourself as too big in your own eyes. I'm like that. You know, I, I, I tell you, I, people honor me everywhere I go. I, I was standing somewhere the, the other night, a couple of nights ago at this crusade. Everybody was coming up to me. Oh, the great prophet. Oh, this. Uh, we want you to come here. We want you to do that. I've been seeing your things online. Wow, wow. The one after the other after the other. At the time, I was looking. I was just like, yeah, okay. And I always do this, make sure I have your number. And I've, I have, I think in one file I have about 10,600 numbers. Why? Because I network with people. It's for future purpose that we can reach out to people because there's no impact without contact. So I just make sure I have your number, I save it, we'll talk later. But I'm not receiving their accolades at all. I feel like. I'm, I'm looking at achieving something else. I'm, my mind is not where their mind is. And I think that's a great key, you know. There's a movie, there's a, there's a line from a movie, it's called The Gladiator, if you ever see that one. And this Maximus guy says it in the last of the movies, in the last scene to this evil, arrogant emperor, fraudulent guy who took the throne. He killed his... He killed the father and took the throne. And then there was another one. He started killing everybody, so he took it himself. He wasn't, he wasn't even the right choice. And he had a sister who, you know, he's demanding her to respect him and honor him. And, and she's like, you know, in her, in her mind, and her spirit, she's, she hated him, you know, because he was an arrogant little twit, really. And uh, the gladiator said to him, this classic line, he said, your day of honoring yourself is now coming to an end. The day of you honoring yourself is coming to an end. And sure enough, he killed him and he fell dead. And I won't tell the rest of them about the story. But So pride is a killer. Here's another thing. If you want to resist God, if you want to resist God, be proud. Think too much of yourself. The, you know, Paul said, this is a formula for divine success, for divine abundance, for divine breakthrough. Paul said, you ought not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. But he, and he, also, he also wrote this, let this mind that was in Christ Jesus also be in you. He thought it not robbery, being e he thought it not wrong to be equal with God because he was God. But yet he took on the form of a servant. You know, this spirit of humility, of the fear of God, this, this, humil this, uh, this, this level of humility, like I don't want to walk in arrogance and haughtiness and pride. It really, oh man, I feel the annoying. It really does something for you. So Nehemiah got the vision from God. He didn't care. He rebuked those ones. 
And he said, that as they were laughing at him, he answered them back. He said, will you rebel against the king? So Nehemiah said in verse 20, Nehemiah 2.20, So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Because these guys were sure going to fight him all the way and he wasn't going to have the provision from them or anyone around. They were probably going to see to that they try to frustrate him. But the God of heaven himself will prosper us. And therefore we his servants will arise and build. But you mockers and haters will have no heritage nor right nor memorial in Jerusalem. You won't have any, but we will. What made him say that? The Holy Ghost. Was he being arrogant? No. Because the, the order that was set up by that evil king was an evil thing. So he wasn't really supposed to be submitted to it anyway, by reality, because it was a, an, evil ordin, an evil ordinance or operation of men. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. He thought he was somebody. God had him down like an animal eating grass and humbled them really well, didn't he? Look at Herod. Stood up like he's the God. Look at me. I'm the big man. And the angels smote him and worms filled him and ate him up and he just dropped dead right there. There's another king that was evil that he got all these horrible diseases come on him. It's so graphic. I don't even want to talk about it. Really horrific diseases and he died like that. You know? Look at Gehazi, who was, was supposed to be, a, was, was, was going to walk in the guise of being a prophet, a real prophet with, with a great heritage and legacy. But he, be, but he was greedy and he was a thief and he was a liar. And God cursed him and he got the leprosy that was on name and came on him and it never left him. Look at Miriam and uh, Aaron back in, is it Numbers 11? Which chapter? I think it's somewhere in Numbers talked about Moses and she was like mad at Moses like another time they didn't like his wife the wife that he picked Zipporah whatever her name was Zippy if that was her name I can't I'm trying to remember she was a dark-skinned lady maybe they didn't they didn't like that but she's beautiful so Moses liked her I, I can, I can relate to that. So it's like Miriam was like, hey, you know, why is Moses better than us? I'm his big sister. God said, really? You I speak to maybe in dark sayings. You might get a few revelations. But him I speak to as a man would speak face to face with him as his own friend. And she was incensed at that. So God got so mad at her, he struck her with leprosy. Do you know what? Miriam would have died with leprosy. She would have died. God wasn't going to take back the act that he did. Moses cried for her, and God said, Okay, since you ask me, my servant, my friend, I'll, I'll do what you ask. And she got healed. So the one that she was arguing to say, Why does he have this authority and this great thing? Well, don't we have it too? Questioning even why her own brother would have all this and she didn't have it. God said, you don't like it? Then go out. Go, you know, I've made my choice. And, and, and even the one who then got her healed, didn't leave her like that, was again the same brother. Look at Joseph, another story in the Bible. Joseph, when the brothers came in the time of the famine and saw now he's... he's when they, finally, when they saw that he was elevated to be the prime minister, and now he has their life in his own hand, like they threw him away to die before that. His life was in their hands, so to speak, because they sold him out to, uh, for like about, tw they said it's about $12, some, some small amount of money, and they sold him off to be a slave. And uh, he... he uh, <laughs> wow. He was afflicted by them. But now, just to get some food and mercy in the palace, they found out he's now the boss. He could have cut them all to the pieces right there. He could have called the guards and said, these evil ones, they're criminals, you know. 
And then if he even wanted to tell the king, his boss, because he was now the number two man, the prime minister under the, the Pharaoh, he could say, you know, these are the ones that did all this to me. The king would have said, really? They treated you like that? Hey, Joseph, you don't even have to make a, a judgment in this matter. I'll do it. Take those guys and execute them. It would have happened, it would have happened in the same hour. And, and, and Joseph had mercy on them. And he said the most almost stupendous statement. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for my good. I don't, know, I don't think we always like that kind of terminology. Because the process is hard. But, the, but I'll tell you a principle. You want to go up high? You want to go far? You want to be blessed? You want to be elevated? First comes the price, then comes the prize. First comes the process, then comes the promotion. You want to go high in life? You want to go high in the things of God? You have to be processed. The process will come before the promotion. The price has to be paid before the prize is won. You got to know that. A lot of people don't want to pay the price. The great Catherine Coleman, the great healing evangelist, said something. She said, anything you want in life, and even anything you see happening in, through my life and ministry, you can also have it, if you can pay the price. Charles G. Finney, Charles Grandison Finney, the great revivalist in the 18th uh, century in, in the east coast of America, went all through there. Thousands upon thousands got saved. He never even... You know, the encounter of the presence of God hit whole cities when he just appeared. He said, prayer is like water to me. It's like my breath. It's like breathing. It's like drinking water. It's, it's, my, it's my well of life. It never stops in me. And he had intercessors even to go ahead of him to pray over cities. I think we stop. I think even the church has even stopped that now. You know, Reinhard Bonnke, the great healing evangelist, used to have people, intercessors under the, under the platform. They'd be under there crying day and night. Some of, them, some of these days might think, hey, those people are making too much noise. I, I, I wonder what I would do. I, I have to check myself. They're like, hey, look, stop screaming under there. You're making noise. You're disturbing me. You know, they're under there. Look up. Can you imagine listening to that? Reinhard Bonnke didn't care. Or maybe they had to stop before he actually, the, the actual meeting started. I, I, I would think so. Otherwise, it would be chaotic. But there are people under there. Under the platform, all around, praying for days, maybe weeks. Maybe they were planning certain events for months. And those, the realms of prayer. Can I tell you, every powerful ministry, the most powerful ministries alive today, and several of them are in Nigeria, are products of prayer. I spent two full days this week, from two days ago and the day before, three days and two days ago. With Dr. Paul Enenche, who, who, who owns and has built the largest church building on planet Earth. What kind of statement is that? The interior, I didn't finish the story, I told you that the, the roof alone cost millions upon millions of dollars, and they paid cash for it. And it's 293 meters long. Inside the building, there's 100,000 seats, about 100,000 seats. And when they have their meetings, the church is full, and there are thousands outside in overflow. How, how does that happen? I want to tell you how. So that's a phenomenon. Who could even do that? Well, guess what? His father, David Oyedipo, did it. And the Lord really, really, really challenged me this morning. I heard this so strong, the anointing. I was so strong when I was thinking about this. Who is your spiritual father? Who's your spiritual covering? Who are you connected to that brings the life of God to you? It's important. Principles, okay, number one, I said diligence. Number two, passion. It's an, your vision is an obsession. And then look at the, 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 the examples in the Bible. Then humility, okay, I talked about humility. I talked about the reference point of Israel, you know. Very powerful. And then tithing and offerings, you know. You're, you're in financial covenant from a biblical economic system. 
the, the biblical economic order, you're doing things that way. Like Abraham gave to Melchizedek. Even his, he was even tithing for future generations. He was giving tithes of his wealth to the high priest who was likened really like the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I received a prophecy that like I'm like Melchizedek. They said <laughs> this, this event happened and they called me up on the platform and they were saying, okay, we're going to say it's Abraham and then Melchizedek and you, Prophet Thomas, you, Thomas Mendon, you're, you're Melchizedek. And I've never, I've never gotten away from that. People have just reminded me of it all the time. It was really prophetic, you know. And Melchizedek was who? The receiver of tithes. I'm a tither, and I could say that you can tithe into this order and this work because uh, you'll get blessed by doing it. But know this again, the Lord challenged me this morning. This morning, today, I heard this so strong from the Lord. If you want a lot of money in your life, if you're not first a tither and a giver, it can't happen. From God. So I thought, well, people that operate different ways, how do they do it? They, well, they did it of their own volition. They were smart enough to figure out how to run a business, how to run an organization, and they're making a lot of money from it. But you look at the, the list of billionaires in the world, the biggest percentage of number from a very small group of people, the Jews, the Israelites, we might say, and the percentage of billionaires in business today that are of Jewish descent, that are Israelites, is the highest of any group of people on earth. So how, how did that happen? There was a covenant made by God, from God, with the people, and that thing has gone down the generations. Even people that don't know Jesus, they don't know the Messiah, they don't do church, they don't do any of that. They're not practicing even their really religion of Judaism, uh, really. But they're doing well. By, why? Because there was a spoken promise. So they, they relate to that. I'll tell you something else. The six million people that were killed, or more, in the Holocaust in, in Germany in, in, in uh, the 1940s, I guess from 39 to 45, about over like a six year period only, they're about. They say in Israel there's not, is not even one family, this is, this is really strange, there's not even one family that hasn't had some relative of theirs killed there. Why? They were scattered everywhere. But the line of Jews that were out there, and then in 1947, or 48, whichever the year was, 48 maybe, May, I think it was May of 48, was it May of 48? And God said, reassemble, back after World War II and after the Holocaust, now go back to your homeland. And now all the people that are there, all of them were touched by the tragedy of murder that happened through Adolf Hitler and the evil satanic SS and, and the, the German military and whatever, whatever they were. It affected everybody. You know what that does? That also brings them together and they can talk about it and relate. But also remember this, the main point is they have a covenant that went way back. God said to David, I'll bless your house to a thousand generations. And we see that it's been, it's been uh, analyzed and somebody came up with this number that they thought that maybe 247 or 248 generations have now happened since David, but God said, I'll bless it to a thousand. So that means there's 753 left if the Lord doesn't come back. That's how much God thought of David. Do you know the power of that, of that spoken word? So now I want to say this. The next thing is hearing from God, a divine formula for financial abundance. Hearing from God to do what? What is will is according to your purpose. Dr. Paul Anenche, bless, his, bless his, his heart and his life, what a man of God. He said something powerful. He said, uh, he said, some ministries, they get finished when they move somewhere to the wrong place. They take a diversion to somewhere else. They do something they weren't supposed to do. But they started well, they were humble, and then they get lifted up and they think they're so important. You know, the Lord will like leave them there. So now, 
Maybe I wanted you to pastor 150,000 people. I wanted you to have something so huge, but I'll leave you at uh, your 5,000 or wherever you think, because you think you're such a big man. I don't want you to go to hell when you get more power. See, more power challenges you to be more humble. You think you're so important and you're so arrogant, now you're the Lord of everybody. God will cut you down or he'll just leave you. He'll stop you in your tracks, maybe just to rescue you from your future destruction. Because the power went to your head. So he said he was looking for a place and he started meeting somewhere. And then he got to a certain point he couldn't break past a certain limit. And he went to pray. And he said he was praying five hours a day, having five hours a day of prayer. God said increase it to seven. You think you're praying five hours a day, isn't that enough? God said, no, pray more. Then he said, one day he said, have five services. He was having three services, and the second one was full, the first one was half, and the, the, oh, 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 almost full. And the third one, they were just still working on it. And then God said, go to five services. When he was in the right place and he heard the voice of God and he obeyed, he said, when he announced it, the next Sunday, all five services were completely packed and people were outside. Where they came from, we don't know. Archbishop Harrison Nanga, who I relate to as a father, a wonderful man of God. After I was there preaching for him, prophesied that there'd be expansion in the, in the church. They, they had about seven or eight, they were running about seven or eight thousand, seven to eight thousand on a Sunday morning in total at the, the, the highest uh, attended service. Now they broke out. They went past like 11, they went past 12,000. And then I said, this property here needs to be built. Something needs to happen. You need to expand. So they're expanding now, and they're going to blow the wall out on the side, and they're going to go that way, and they're going to put more seats, and the, the construction is, 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 is undergoing. In fact, there's a piece of land right next to theirs, which is very hard, on the main highway in the capital city. That one piece of land there is worth billions upon billions of shillings. You can't even, and you can't even get it. So this land has been... Very dormant, they said it's even owned by an Israelite. Can you imagine? Israelites are everywhere. You can't escape them because they're blood. That an old Israeli, maybe he died or maybe he's old or he's not around. And it's like the land is just sitting there not being used. So they said, okay, we can't locate how to buy this or how to make a deal. So it's just there. So let's just take dominion on the earth and move. And, you know, we'll see what happens later. We'll just go for it. That's a bold lion who's going to say, we need more space for our people to come to church. That is happening right now as we speak. God, I see the angel of the Lord right now just flashing behind the camera here. Standing right here, right behind the camera. The angel of the Lord standing right there. And all this happened. He told me after one of the services I was preaching at, he said, Prophet, we were upstairs in his office. Uh, it's a real privilege to sit in his office because it's an executive place and you have to be invited. They have the buzzer on the door, you know, uh, the protocols are all lined up, the guards, you, you, they have to hear from the boss and bring them in. You can't just appear there. There's nowhere to just appear there. It's not, it's not possible. So I'm sitting in his office, you know, they're bringing me food and cake and coffee and fruits and sitting there smiling. They're all so happy. Wow, what a service. And he told me something powerful. He said, Prophet, he said, Doctor, I ordered... A thousand more chairs, and we put them out this Sunday, and every single one of them was filled, and I don't know where the people came from. <laughs> Can I tell you another obstacle to that? It was on the day of the marathon, where they closed the roads in the city, on the day of the marathon. I mean, roads were closed. For me to get there to preach, it was so nerve-wracking. We had to drive around, go the wrong way in the road, find another way. The police had to open up the, 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 the barricades for us because, hey, I, the, the speaker, the prophet, is in the car here. He needs to get to the church right now. And the clock was ticking. I had to be there. I had to go. I was going live on Faith TV at 11 o'clock. It's now 10-something, and I'm still like, we got to get in there. My camera crew had to set up and all that. I'm like, man, we got to be there. And the marathon was that day. Can you believe roads were closed and still... The thousand empty chairs got filled. How did people even get there? It was supernatural. For a man that had a vision, who heard from God, who's working with God, and his prophet, myself, who God sent there,
to prophesy of the breakthrough and the expansion and the increase, and it's just happening supernaturally. Are you seeing how this all goes together? Even the prophet will work with the apostle, and we build things together. Why? It's in the perfect plan of God. So whatever it is that you need to be doing, you need to hear from God and not divert. And just do that and be. I tell you, I have a feeling that I've had the last two, two weeks or so, and I keep seeing a particular part of the city, and I'm seeing some property or some building there. I don't know how this thing is going to work, but I keep seeing it. I have to explore that now. I have to go there and comb it and, or have people look at every building that's in that corner, in that particular road where the two roads meet, uh, right, next, right, right at the uh, uh, threshold of, of the city. Not in the city, but right across the highway, right up, right there. I'm seeing a place. I have to explore it and see, see what we can come up with. I don't know. I just feel some uncanny direction to explore that. We'll see how it works out. I'm not making any announcements yet. but And uh, the Archbishop, Harrison Nanga, he got this place right on the, right on the main uh, Uhuru Highway, you'd say, where the, Mombasa Road, where it meets Uhuru Highway. The main road, the, high, the little road, main boulevard, whatever, that goes right uh, in front of the capital city. But they're landlocked. And when they bought that property, they didn't buy the one behind it, he told me, for some whatever, whatever the obstacle was. And they didn't maybe think they needed it at the time because their ministry was smaller. Less thousands of people. Now it's more thousands of people. So what happened with him? He got this land somewhere and bought it already. And, and the Lord showed him to build. I, I, I got to tell the prophecy first. I'm speaking. He invited me to speak at the Faith TV uh, fifth anniversary. Which was on July 23rd last year on a Sunday. And that's, that's on our YouTube channel. That video is on my YouTube channel. You can find it. Faith TV, 5th anniversary. And I began to prophesy. You had me come up to prophesy. About 30 minutes. I spoke about 30 minutes or so. I, whatever it was. And the Lord showed me towers it erected in the sky. And I began to weep. It was so strong. An open vision. I don't know what I was seeing. I was seeing it actually before. During the celebration that was going on before I was invited to speak I started seeing it in open visions and I began to share him and his wife lifted his hands the daughter lifted her hands the elders the bishops the, all his pastors began to lift their hands because I think they knew what I couldn't have known and I saw fire coming out from the towers I said I saw towers plural s if you watch the video towers how words, I said it, it's on, you see it on the video. I couldn't have known, the Holy Ghost showed me. And he said, he told afterwards, he told the people, he said, you know, it's amazing, the prophet of God. He said, I have upstairs in my office architectural plans to build twin towers, twin towers on the new property we have. But the prophet Thomas Manton didn't know anything about it. I'd never told him. He couldn't have known. And this is not public knowledge that everyone's talking about on the street. It's very private. I have the architectural plans upstairs to build the Twin Towers. And he said, now that God has spoken, we're confident. It's a confirmation that God, he couldn't have known. There was no way for him to know this. And the Lord showed him as his prophet. And he spoke it forth. And now... We have the confidence we're going to go full speed with it, with acceleration. We know that we're not going to worry about the money because it's going to cost billions. We don't care. It's going to work. Then I'm, I'm speaking in a conference with a, a bunch of delegation from Nigeria in his conference at his, at his uh, Central Business District Church branch, which also seats, uh, I guess, a couple thousand people. And... Uh, The Lord speaks to me about the billion flow, billions, cash, business people being raised up, prophesied. It's on, again, it's on the channel. You can see the clip. I think it's called, uh, 
new prophecies over Nairobi, Kenya, at the CFF, CBD, church, whatever, something like that. And a lot of people are taken to that video clip. They're sharing it with all their friends. Really great. So, and the Lord spoke about that. So, what is this thing about financial abundance? It's really for the purpose of God. Lift your hands. It's really for the purpose of God. It's really for the work of the calling that you have. That's what it's for. And if you're serving God, like I begin to say, you, it's almost like a, 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 a dream of carnality that you think all these pleasures, but two places in scripture, Psalm 1611, let's, let's look at that. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Pleasures. Another one, Job 36, 11. If you serve him, as you serve him, and you do it well, passionately, with all your life and all your might and all your strength and all your heart and mind, and all your time and all your energy and all your whatever resource you have and whatever time you have, you serve him passionately. He said, then your days and years will be filled with, with prosperity and pleasures. I want to declare that as you're serving God, you'll have the best house, you'll have the best vehicles, you'll have full pantries, you'll have full closets of clothes, you'll have too many cars to park, you'll have too many clothes for your closets, you'll have too much food for your storage places in your, your whatever, your dining areas or your kitchens or whatever. You'll have too many friends, you'll have too many people working for you, you have too many things that you, you, you can't process it all because God said, I take pleasure, Psalm 35, 27 again, let's look at it. I take pleasure in the prosperity of my servant. Who? The one who favors my righteous cause, David said. I used to think that was God speaking. Thus saith the Lord, they who favor my righteous cause. The Lord said, mm, 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 mm. Uh, go back and read it, son. I read it over several times. This is many, many years ago. It's not recently. I, many, many years ago I've known this. This was David talking about his cause. Wasn't the Lord speaking like, thus saith the Lord, my righteous cause. David had the righteous cause because he had heard from God and he was doing what he wanted him to be doing. And he said, this is a righteous thing. Those that favor it, God himself will take pleasure in your prosperity. I want to say this. I don't have a problem with anybody prospering to whatever level you want. Join the Mercedes-Benz Club. Get one. Join the Range Rover Club. Join the Rolls-Royce Club. Join the Private Jet Club. Join the, the greatest uh, land and place where you can uh, live. It's okay. We'll rejoice. Do the best you can in business. Why? When you're serving God, it's part of the promise. Not based on what we're talking about or what a man would talk about. But based on the fact that this is the word of the Lord, I'll take pleasure in your prosperity. Job 22, verses 21 to 28 is another powerful passage of Scripture. He said, return to the Almighty, and thereby you're doing good, and in peace you'll be at peace, and you'll be doing good. And he said, then you'll have gold laid up for you as in the dust. Everything around your life will begin to prosper. God even said, I will also be your gold and your silver. I'll be your defense. Because I have everything. When I'm with you, you'll also have everything. Are you seeing that? Is this deep? I'm going deep into this thing. Because I'll, people need to understand, how do I get blessed? Is it just by a, a fluke of, uh, of an accident? Or, or maybe it's some strange miracle. All of a sudden, no. And your life is like hell. You're living, like, you're, you're living wrong. You're not doing what God wants. How is he supposed to reward you if you're not doing anything? Let me tell you, laziness is, is definitely the road to poverty. Scriptural reference would be Proverbs <laughs> that says, A little folding of the hands, a little slumber, a little sleep, and so shall your poverty come to you. I love the scripture in Proverbs that says, A wealthy man has many friends, but the, to the poor man, even his neighbor hates him. 
It's time for some proofs and production of God's blessings and manifestation, I'm telling you right now. Another thing, don't confide too much in people because they can't help you anyway. Go to God. Here's another secret for divine abundance. Financial abundance. A, a blessed life. Always be praying. I was talking about prayer. God told the, the apostle, Dr. Anetje, to pray from five hours to seven hours and go to, from three services to five services. But he told some stories about places where he was where he could only hit a, a particular uh, threshold and he couldn't get past that in the realm of attendance and growth and all that. He just got stuck at some point and it just wouldn't go past that. He went to God. God said, increase, number one, increase your prayer from five hours to seven hours a day. This man is amazing. He came in the morning, flew all the way from Nigeria on his private jet, brought his whole team, had the whole thing set up. They didn't come the night before to be rested in the hotel, settled, drive to the meeting in the morning. He actually flew across the continent of Africa from the west to the east the same morning, arrived there, dressed on the plane, whatever, or came out from the house dressed or whatever, put on his suit on, his, on the plane. I don't know how he did it. Gets out. The people receive him, very relaxed. They give him all the Maasai things, all the, you know, regalia, honor, stick, and all this stuff and all that. And they come, and they walk straight into the meeting, boom, right to the platform. Everything is set. And then they did two services, morning to the afternoon, then evening to the late evening. Then uh, met with some of the leaders, and I had the privilege to talk to him personally twice. He prayed for me and spoke to me personally as a friend, in a friendly way. We had a friendly conversation twice. Well, on the way out, he prayed with me again, grabbed my hand, all the security. These, these guys are crazy. They're all making lines with their arms and all that, pushing, you know, keeping people. He broke it and pulled me over and then laid hands on me and prayed for me as, he's, as he was leaving. Because I stayed for the prayer meeting. I wasn't going to leave. Somebody's leaving and they wanted to, uh, us to go together. I said, no, go ahead. I'm, I don't do what you want to do. I'm staying. And he had a, pr a live prayer service, and I got a lot out of that. In fact, I want to incorporate some of those things that he was doing. So powerful about prayers and declarations. I mean, my God. And the miracles that are happening because of it. Why? Because they're praying. Prayer is what? The conversation with God. You want to be a tither. You want to be in the purpose. You want to be a giver. You want to be generous. You want to be humble. Humble. You want to be hungry for the Holy Ghost. All of those things. But you, you need to be praying. I had the privilege of spending three days, two or three days again, with the other premier apostle. Another premier, another premier apostle from Nigeria, John, uh, Apostle Johnson Suleiman, last month. And that man is anointed, let me tell you right now. He called me, pulled me out of the crowd. I was there in the front, and he grabbed me and prayed over me, prophesied over me. Thousands of people, shed, like 10,000 people shouting with a loud voice. It was astounding. And he says, anything you get from me, this is statements he made, he said it like three times during his meetings. Anything you get from me, the, most, the biggest thing you can get from me is the mantle of prayer. Prayer. The flow of prayer. These people pray all the time, they never stop, and you wonder why they have such brilliance, such ingenuity, such power, so many miracles, such brilliant, sharp minds, so much health and life and energy. Someone says, who can keep those schedules? Who can work like that? But they do. Even Archbishop Harrison Nanga, he had five services on Sunday, he starts at 6 a.m. and goes to 2 p.m. Every Sunday, nonstop. Five services. Five. I think in uh, Winter's Chapel in, in Lagos, they have seven. Starting at 5.30 in the morning, and they go to about uh, 6 a.m. maybe, and they go to, again, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But they do it in shorter intervals. I think each service is an hour and 15 minutes. So it's like one, so they, they got seven into that time frame. Normally it's a little longer, you'd have five. Where do you get that kind of energy to work every day? And since I, I got more connected with Archbishop, I, I, I feel this, 
this energy to do more meetings and my schedules increased a lot. I'm preaching everywhere, all these events going everywhere. I don't care. I, I, have, I have the grace for it. In fact, I don't even feel like I'm doing a lot. I want to do more. That's another thing I want to say. Whatever you've achieved, you can't think that you've arrived anywhere. You still want to do more. Someone said to Dr. Paul Anencia, you've built the largest building on the planet. You have so much going on. So many millions of people, literally millions of people have been blessed through your, your life and ministry. Is that good? Are you successful? He says, he says no, I, I, there's so much more. He said, even after all we've seen God do through us, we, there's more. There's a greater phase, a greater dimension. And you always be looking at that. You, you almost feel like all the preparation, all the things that have done before, were all, all the things that have happened before were only preparation for what's coming. This was stated. Look at Moses. Moses trained 80 years for a 40-year assignment. He didn't, train, he didn't train 40 years for an 80-year assignment. He was trained 80 years for a 40-year assignment. And the 40 years was the third phase. It's like you could say all that I've done or had or seen is just a step to go to the next phase, which, is, which will be the greatest one. Spiritual connection. You learn from great mentors. You, you learn from great apostles. You learn from great business moguls in the business world. You learn from great leaders. You, you, you can't do it by yourself. If you could do it by yourself, it, it would have all been done before. So my admonition, strong suggestion, an instruction to everyone is connect with the grace of God. Connect with what's working. It'll help push you to that dimension that you haven't gotten to yet. Um, a, a multimillionaire was asked by a young man, I saw this, I, I like this statement. I'll repeat it again. I said it, I've said it before. He said, how do you attain all these millions of dollars? You didn't have it before. When did you break through? What, what was the time when you made, when you weren't making a lot of money and all of a sudden you were? He said, and what did you do? He said, he said, I did all the work that I never wanted to do before. All the important, brilliant work that I hadn't done yet that I really didn't want to do. And he said, where is the wealth and success for people like you've experienced? He said, it's hidden in all the work that you didn't want to do. That's, that's amen or ouch to that, both amen and ouch. It's like you're getting slapped when you hear that principle. Some things you didn't want to do, you have to do. You say, I didn't really want to do that. That's too much or what? No, that's, that's where the success is. Because even Albert Einstein, the brilliant thinker, said something so powerful. He said, Insanity, a definition of it is this. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Dr. Mike Murdoch made up, uh, who's also one of my mentors and spiritual fathers for many, many decades now. He said, when you want something you never had, you have to do something you've never done. He has a statement on his voicemail which the whole world won't have the privilege of hearing it, but I have his private phone number, so when I call, when I used to call, he never would have a phone that can be answered. It was always a voicemail. But he had this as, a, as an insignia or recorded message as a, on his voicemail. He'd say, to be unforgotten, you have to do something unforgettable. So do it. Leave a message, and I'll return a telephone call to you as soon as I can. Thank you. Click. Beep. Then you talk and see if he'll call you back. Depending on maybe how, how great the thing you said. So I said, I like that, but I want to make my own. So here's what I did. I said, to be remembered, you have to do something memorable. <laughs> so do it. <laughs> Leave your message and let's see how brilliant it is, you know. I still have that on, on my voicemail.
uh, today. If you call my uh, USA number, I think you'll hear that recording. To be remembered, do something memorable. He said to be unforgotten, you have to do something unforgettable. Remember that song by Nat King Cole? And I love the one when his daughter sang with it uh, virtually. Natalie Cole, she also died. She's there. He died young and she's, she's also gone. Unforgettable, that's what you are. Unforgettable, from near or far. Wow, what a song. Every time I hear that song, I just feel something so special and so deep. Unforgettable. How unforgettable are you? How unique are you? Another key to great success and favor is your uniqueness. Your significance is not found in your similarity to another because if you stand with someone else and compare yourself to them, they'll vote for themselves and say they're more important than you. They'll choose themselves. I hate that demon of competition. When I see somebody and I feel irritated by it, I exit the scene. I did it again the last couple of days. People walk around, hi, prophet, how are you? And then you, know, you look at them, they're doing all that. And there's no connection. You know? There's no camaraderie. There's no real friendship. One day they were saying, oh, we need to get together. Like, I really have to share some things with you. And then it just goes like that. And then, you know, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. How does somebody make you feel? And how important do they try to make you feel? they just like, you're just like there, like you're just another fixture of the furniture. Or they think they're so much more important than you, which is their right. That's okay. I'm not, I don't want to get into that part of it. But how does somebody make you feel? Are you relevant to them? Are you valuable to them? If you stay in an environment like that, it'll mess you up. It'll mess your emotions up. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Years ago, I saw a very insecure, nervous young man. And, and, I, and I was marveling at his nervousness. Unsure of himself. It, it's irritating. It's an irritating environment. You almost can't stay next to somebody like that. Let me tell you something. Be delivered from all that in Jesus' name right now. Relax and be confident in who you are. Be smooth and graced, you know, empowered, confident, smooth, excellent. And let it flow. That nervous spirit is a flipping demon from hell. It's bad. It wrecks the environments, you know. And, and I'll tell you something. The Lord spoke to me about this young man. I said, Lord, look at him. He, I can't stay next to this guy. He's trying to talk to me and be with me, and I'm just irritated. The Lord spoke to me. He says, that young man is a good man. He said, but he's, he's, he's all up in the wrong environments. He had a bad upbringing. He has, he's not settled. Uh, pray for him. I did. I prayed for him. I was in Paris, France on the platform speaking. There was a woman there. I know that demon when I see it. And I, when I see it, I want to attack it and destroy it because I hate that demon. I hate what the devil does to people, good, especially good people. Like the Lord said, that he's a good young man. He's a good man. I was in America. And I was in Paris, France, preaching. On the platform of this great church. And there's a woman who was part of the worship team. Very beautiful lady. But I could see that demon, like it, that spirit, all from her insides up to on her. It was just like unsure, you know, insecure, nervous, low self-esteem. I'm telling you, the power of God had me grab her and cast that thing out of her. She, the power of God hit her. She fell out. She got up free. She was shining like the noonday sun. I'm glad, thrilled. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege. Do it through me again and again and again everywhere. I'm thrilled that God sent me as a deliverer to that one person in Paris, France. Thousands were touched through the ministry, but that one person, I know I was sent for them. And I'm happy about it. If we were much more organized with teams and all that, you know, sometimes when you get speaking in a church, you can't really talk to everybody. You know, they, they have these systems, like even the pastors are insecure, you know, they protect their, they have a whole system. And then you as the speaker, you got to go back to the office when you finish. And, I, I was in Chicago 
Chicago, Illinois, in this church. And when I got there, I saw a demon sitting on top of the building. I thought, Lord, did you send me here? Is this okay? I sat in the car, I was very disturbed. A demon, a big, ugly devil, was a, like a, in the form of a man, was sitting on top of the building. I saw him, you said you saw him? Yes, I did, like I'm looking at the screen here. Like I'm looking at anybody. He was dressed with a, a funny top hat, a cape, like a bow tie, like elegant, like a, like, like a, like a pimp, you know? Like a pimp, really, like a pimp that has prostitutes that work for them. That's what the church was about, if I come, come to see it. So I'm there, I thought I have to go in here and preach, right? So two things happened. I'll tell you the, fir the first part first, well, uh, the, on the point that I'm talking about. After I finished speaking, they pull me back into the office. There's no one in the office, there's couches. I'm sit I sit down, I'm sitting there by myself. Within 30 seconds, I was so bored. I was like, what am I sitting here? And they were like, they wanted to bring me, this was way, this was years ago before the, uh, the sanitizer became popular because of the nonsense that happened in the world a couple years back. Before that. And they wanted to give me hand sanitizer and, you know, napkins and all this thing. I said, ah. I said, I don't need that. So I got up and the, whoever was the worker of the stuff, they looked really shocked and incensed. I got up, I walked right past them. It was almost like they didn't want me to go out of the office. I, I almost looked at them like, get out of my way. Get out of the doorway. I'll knock you down. I walked straight out. I went right back to the people. I started talking to everybody, shaking hands with everybody, saying hi to everybody. I said, this is where I'm supposed to be. The shepherd's supposed to be with the sheep, right? It's sitting in the office. Do you want, what do you want to drink? Juice or tea or... In the hand sanitizer. I said, what is this nonsense? Get out of here. I went back out. I didn't care. I wasn't going to go back anyway, so I didn't even really care if they liked it or not. In that particular instance. But in other, in other cases, you know, you want to follow some of the protocols maybe a little bit. I don't know. So anyway, next story. So the Lord had me call for a certain seed, right? And people lined up. It was, I mean, it was a couple of hundred people lined up in a single line, all the way down the aisle to the back of the church to sow this seed. They all came with it. Can you imagine? And the church, I even think if I remember right, they played games with the money too, uh, but it's all right. But so many people lined up to give that seed. The first one was the pastor. So I'm walking toward, I'm gonna stretch my hand out and touch the person and bless them that is sowing the seed and he, the pastor, the pastor there, was the first one in the line. And when I got to go near him to touch him, the whole, a wind of the Holy Ghost hit me from the back, physically knocked me about five or six feet that way. I almost fell down. It was so forceful. Hit me like that. Pushed me, physically pushed me. Invisible. Nobody was there. Push me. And I went around him and got to the second person, like went in a loop like that, got to the second person. I never could touch him, and I touched the next one, next one. And the people falling out. Boom, boom, they're all falling out. He was, he was left standing there, but my back, I was already down the line. I was really wondering about that, but the Lord wouldn't let me bless him. Then I found out some things, discovered some things that were going on in that church. Very not good. I won't tell details. So, one thing, he had like two, two or three cars outside, you know, Cadillac, uh, another car, another little luxury cars. Yeah? And then he stood up and said, uh, before I came on to speak, he said, he wanted someone in the church to like co-sign for another car because he wants to get the big new Lincoln car. And he wanted someone to come and co-sign a note for him. He actually said it over the microphone. I'd never, I'd never heard anything like that in my life. Anyway, moving right along, <laughs> if I could just tell one story out of it. And there were other things that I, could, I was noticing that were even worse. So, and a real, a real divine connection was there. A few of them were there. Anyway, so we, 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 we saw some good things come out of that, that one event. 
But God is in the people business. We are in the people business. I want to say something else. You want to really grow and succeed, include other people in the vision. I'm speaking this. I'm speaking it over all of us. Bring other people up. Want to see other people become successful. Desire that. Success breeds success. When everybody's succeeding, we're all happy. You know, the spirit of joy that was on the servants of Solomon was there because they were so prosperous. And he also trained, he also got, got happy people. Proverbs 3.13, write this down. Let's look at this, a very powerful verse. Proverbs 3.13 says, Happy is the one who finds wisdom. Happy. Happy people. Joyful, joy-filled people. Disgruntled, arrogant, undermining, competitive, strife-bearing, double-tongued, bad-charactered, bad actors, bad characters, miserable, messed up people are not to be in a place of functionality, to be in the front of things because they're going to... Uh, Lord, how'd you get me into this? This is powerful. They're, they're just, they're just, something's just not right. Now, I pray this, because a lot of people have their miseries, and their, your misery can, can become your ministry. Your trial can become your triumph. Your victimization can become your victorious breakthrough. Your mess can become your message. Hello. Your test can become your testimony. Your trial can become your triumph. Oh, yes. Your trial can become your triumph. Your triumphal entry, <coughs> your triumphant entry, your triumphant entry can come from A day after you've walked on a very hard road. Can I give you an example again? Joseph. He went from the pit to the palace in a day. He was thrown into the prison. Psalm 105, 17, 18, down, down there. 16, 17, 18 says, They hurt his feet with fetters of iron, with chains of iron. His feet were scarred. The metal dug into his flesh and was infected and then and then scarred over, scabbed over, disgusting, then scarred over, then he had that, those are the marks of his affliction. Paul even talked about the marks of, the, of an apostle, afflictions that he went through. Mark could be something good, an anointing and a grace and a gift you have, but it could also be the, the, the scars of your afflictions. It's both. The marks I bear... In my body, he said, the marks of the apostle, the afflictions that he suffered. The persecution, the warfare. So you could walk, you know. Look at Jesus. He went from Hosanna, Hosanna, what they call the triumphal entry into the city, because that's the king that he was and the king he was to be. But then that had to be taken away. And then next week they were saying crucify him. Why? Because he had to go that far to pay the price to mediate for us. That's not our position now. When you go through enough suffering that God exalts you and promotes you, then you're going to live in that realm of promotion. You're not going to go back down to another time of trial. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I don't receive it. I also don't believe it, even, spir even spiritually or scripturally. Because when promotion comes from the Lord, you're going to live in that grace. Luke 2.52, let's look at that, so powerful, says he grew in stature and, wi and, and wisdom and, and then favor with God and man. But he had to go to the cross, but our cross came before the elevation. Are you seeing that? 
So you think we're on a roller coaster? You can't find that in Scripture. I'm sorry, you can't. The Bible also says, let's look at this, 2 Peter 1.10. I love this Scripture. It says, if you make your calling and election sure, you're passionate about the purpose of God in your life, then you'll never stumble, which means you'll never lack, you'll never fall, you'll never go off the way. If people have gone off the way because of wrong influences, temptations, sin, or wrong environments, and all those kind of things, you can get turned around and brought back on the right path. I prophesy and I declare and I pray over you today that God will take you there, back onto the great path that he has, and then you're gonna to begin to walk in new favor and new blessings. Say a big amen to that. Divine abundance. Financial abundance. Prosperity. Great prosperity. How does it come to a, how does it come to a human life? I wrote a book called Prophetic Keys to Successful Living, and our dear beloved Archbishop Harrison Nanga, great father of the faith, he published this book for me as a seed, as a gift. And he wrote a forward, three pages about the anointing we carry and about me. You want, you want to read, I gave this book to Dr. Paul Inenche uh, two nights ago. On, uh, well, that was that Thursday night. Now it's Sunday, three nights ago. And uh, he looked at it and said, this is powerful. And I thought, I hope he reads the forward just to see about me. What the great archbishop wrote about me. You know, it, it means something for someone to endorse you. It really does. Don't stay out there in the wilderness. If you're a preacher, even if you're in business, network with other people. The arena you want to go into as a career, network with good people who have you know, gems of wisdom and, and, and ways of operations of doing things to, that, that you can tap into that and begin to uh, implement what you learn from others. If you want to be a great leader, first you have to be a great follower. If you want to be a great man at the top, you first have to be a great man at the bottom. The way up is the way down. The way down, going to be a servant, is the way up. There's no, I just go up and I stay there and then I'm there. No. The Bible says the haughty spirit, pride and arrogance comes before a great fall. And the scripture says in another place, David said, that, I think it's in Samuel, we can find it, I don't know where it is. We'll find it later. Uh, the address of the, of the scripture says, how are the mighty fallen? How is a mighty man fallen? Pride. Look at Saul. God said, you think you're a big man? Okay, have at it. And when he disobeyed him, he says, I'm taking everything away from you. He had the angel kill Herod. Herod. He had... Uh, the, 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 the wicked prophet's assistant judged. The arrogant Miriam judged, as I said. Achan, who stole the money in the camp of Joshua, was killed. Korah, who wanted to oppose Moses, the earth opened up and swallowed him and all his people, uh, his friends and family with him. And they went straight to hell without, down, down into the earth without, without seeing the next day. Ananias and Sapphira stole and lied to the Holy Ghost. I, I don't know if it was the theft or the lying that grieved God the most. But they, Acts chapter 5, they both fell dead. Be careful. Judas Iscariot. There was another Judas who said, Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> one, of the, one of the 12 apostles one, was another one named Judas. There were two Judases. And he said, and then there was Judas, not Iscariot. I really ch chuckle at that. Judas, comma, or in parentheses, not Iscariot, because Iscariot was the bad guy. 
another Judas, one who was good. There with Jesus. There was Nathaniel, there was Bartholomew, there was Andrew, there was Thomas, James, Peter, and John. And all those guys that made up the 12, yes? One of them was Judas, not Iscariot. And then there was Judas Iscariot. What happened to him? He, was, he had a bad nature. He was a thief and a liar. He was jealous. He was competitive. You see that thing again? And, and, and sarcastic and hateful. And he ended up in hell. Judas is not in heaven because Jesus said it would be better for him if he'd never been born. If someone dies, no matter what the death is, if they end up in heaven, it was still better that they were born because they got to go to heaven. It doesn't matter what happened in the earth. That was temporary. Now you're in eternal bliss and glory and paradise forever. Better for him that he was never born. That means his soul was lost. Saul, who the kingdom was taken from him, was down there in the vision Samuel the prophet saw with the witch of Endor. What was he doing down there? Down there with the witch of Endor. That's not heaven, that's hell. Saul was also lost. And, and look at the scripture reference. God said he took the kingdom from him. So we need to be very careful with these things of God, like we say. You want to be blessed, you want to be promoted, you want to be elevated. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. He wants you to be blessed. In fact, he loves it. So I say this prophetically. Have more pleasures. Take it in Jesus' name. My God. This has been, this has been uh, a very enjoyable time for me to share all this. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, Proverbs 8.13 said. The goodness of God will endure continually for us, but we need to fear the Lord. We need to, we need to hate what he hates and love what he loves. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise endures forever. There's also a rest that's for the people of God, according to Hebrews 4.9. Again, when we're doing his will. Now, more keys to abundance, more formulas for, for financial abundance before I wrap this here, is, is the principles of sowing and reaping. Let's look at Genesis 26, 12. Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same time, the same season, says the same year, depending on the translation you're reading, and hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. I like that. He didn't just get the hundredfold, but he also got another blessing. It doesn't say what the blessing is, but you know, it says, and the Lord blessed him. You know, when the Bible says the Lord bless somebody, wow, you better, you better know. That's a big deal. Psalm 126, 5 and 6, those that sow in tears will reap in joy. He that goes forth weeping, but bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing and bringing his sheaves with him. A lot of King James language now. Go it forth and weepeth and bearing and this the seed will produce the harvest. So first there's the tithe, right? Tithing is ten percent of the gross of what you make. Not after you pay your bills. When you first get it, you, you get a hundred thousand, ten thousand is your tithe. Unequivocal. Don't think about, I have to pay this, I have to pay that, I have to do this, and maybe there's something left over. No, then you haven't tithed. And then, if you haven't tithed, have you really given? Really, 
uh, if you want to be very strict about the scripture, from the scripture, I don't mean strict like the point of you, you don't have to be strict or you can be strict. I mean just the, the literal operation of doing it correctly or doing it at all means you first, gave the, you first paid the 10%. Guess what? Your tithe is not a debt you owe. It's not a seed you sow. It's a debt you owe. It's a payment. It's like, an, it's like a bill. It's like an insurance payment. It's like a bill that you, you have to pay. It's an obligation. It's not a seed like, I sow my tithe. I don't know what I'm going to reap. No, God told us in Malachi 3, 10 to 12, clearly he'll open up the windows of heaven. He'll rebuke the devourer for our sake. The devil won't be able to eat your stuff. And he'll make us a delightsome land for him, which means a, our life will be like a place of paradise. This was the promise for the tither. When you pay your tithe, pay, P-A-Y, when you pay it, you don't really give it, you, 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 you just pay it. Now you've done that obligation. Now you can begin to sow. Someone says, I have a thousand shillings or I have ten hundred dollars or ten twenty dollars or fifty dollars. Can I just sow it? Have you tithe first? What where's the discipline in your financial life? Now I have to teach on this because I have to help help take people to good places, to green pastures. Someone said, Well, do I have to do all that? Do what you want. It's your life. Suffer more. Don't get blessed by God. I look at everybody that's really walking in millions, I mean like millions of dollars, big vision. They live holy. They do things correctly and they've always been a tither. I, I know an evangelist, he's a multimillionaire today. I, I could tell testimonies about his life. He was given a private jet to use for free, a Falcon 50, which is an amazing, very expensive multi-million dollar aircraft. All he has to do is pay for the fuel. All the insurance, the maintenance, and all that is done by the owner. And the owner is very serious about the gift because he just told them, can we paint your ministry logo on the tail of, uh, of the plane, the wing of the tail of the plane? That means it's a permanent, you know, you, you don't, if you're thinking about taking it back, like I'm letting you use it, but I might change my mind. He says, well, if I'm going to paint the logo on it, meaning it's yours, man, as long as you, until you tell us you don't need it anymore, it's yours. I think that's a, sealed, a sealing proof of that. That just came out uh, last week. A testimony from the man of God. He said one time he was in the shower and the power went off. And he screamed to his wife. Why didn't you pay the electric bill? How did you forget? And she shouted back at him. Because there's no money. <laughs> she didn't have the money. <laughs> what a rambunctious woman. I like, I like her to that degree. I, uh, I don't know. I looked at her so many times, I thought, uh, she's not my type, but, but she's a bold warrior. And she ha she's working with him to build a ministry. Let me tell you something. Well, they say the better half, uh, behind every good man is a good woman. I, I like that. So good is a very big descriptive word. Because there's a lot of things you see that are not good, but anyway, moving right along. Good means good, mean productive, brilliant, creative, aggressive, passionate about God like you are, flowing together. Like the Bible says, the help meet, right? Genesis 2.18. It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a help meet suitable, compatible, complementary, work ethic, working for with him for the vision that I have. Proverbs 18.22 is another scripture, so powerful. It says, when a man finds a wife, not a knife. When a man finds a wife, not strife. When a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing and obtains a special new grace and favor from the Lord. What a blessing that is. So they worked together when they had nothing. Now they're swimming in millions. But he said this. He said... He finished the shower in the dark, got out, didn't know what was going on, disoriented. He says, I didn't care. He said he lifted his hands to God right there, probably standing there naked and not ashamed, like the song says from Dr. Anenshe's ministry. Naked and not ashamed. What a powerfully anointed song. They sang it in the crusade a little bit, but no one could do it like his daughter. She didn't make it on this trip. She didn't come over. 
his daughter has an anointing of fire on her. She's a singer, a psalmist. Wow, when she sings that song, you just begin to cry. The anointing is so strong. And naked and not ashamed, probably lifted his hands and said, God, it's okay because I paid my tithe this week. I don't care. Shut off the electricity, do whatever. He said, he said to God, he said, I'd rather die than not pay my tithes. Do you know these are the kind of people I listen to and learn from? You listen to me, you're also getting some reference points from other brilliant thinkers and men that walk with God. I'm not here by myself. If I was and I had all of it from God and knew all this, then beautiful. But nobody's an island. Nobody has it all from themselves. We're all products of our environment to one degree or another. Are you getting blessed? Yeah, I'm sharing a lot. I haven't been here in the studio for some weeks. I've been out in events, preaching all over the land in conferences and meetings. But I tell you, this, we need to do this very often, more often, and we will be doing that. So here I could just teach and flow. You see, I can't do this in another church, a live open meeting. I won't be able to go this deep and sit here and share all this for this amount of time and do it the way I want to do it. So and let the Spirit of the Lord just speak through me as he's doing. So he said, I would rather die than not be a tither and keep my covenant with you. Another thing I noticed about him, he has his wife. He married his wife, never slept with another woman. I know another man that did that, younger man. Older man, but when he was younger, even younger than him. When he was called into ministry, found his wife. Now, not all, not all of us have had that privilege, or we messed it up somehow. <laughs> people didn't, didn't do it that way. But I notice a pattern of people that always kept their covenants with God. I want to say this. A key to financial abundance is find, no matter where your life was before, if you came through divorce, or you were in some kind of other issue, or you just didn't follow a pattern a certain way. And then there's people that said, well, I did this, I'm good. I, I have my wife and my children, and I've lived like, yeah, but you, maybe you're still not rich. There's something else you're not doing. So don't get patting yourself on the back like, I'm glad I'm good in that area. Don't be proud of yourself. Fix the other areas. Fix every area. The challenge of God to us is to fix every area. Everything that's not the best perfect thing in our own world. We need to work on it. Whatever it is. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Always had a financial covenant, never missed. Always was straight with his relationship with his wife, always. There's something to that, man, let me tell you. Because if I were to go through the names of people that are totally anointed, very forceful, impacting the world, very rich, very widely exposed through media and all that, very successful in their ministries, There are very few names that you can really come up with and pontificate about. Very few. You look all across the land, you see all kinds of people. Like a, a place like Nairobi, Kenya, one city. There's so many churches. I was with a man of God from Jamaica. Funny thing is, we have a lot in common. I actually lived in the city where he lives now in America. I lived right there. I named the streets where I, the house where I was living and where my post office box was and where the, that was, and I used to run the, have the ministry running from there. And, you know, and his church is right down a mile, a couple of miles down on a certain street. I know the street. And then when I mentioned when I was in Jamaica, he's from the island of Jamaica, and there's a story about that. He said, he said if, you go, if you look it up, Jamaica in the whole world has the most churches per square meter or mile than anywhere on planet Earth. The island is full of churches. 
How many men from, have come out from the island of Jamaica that you know around the world? Now this man went to America. He's not that well known, but he's running in some circles. And he came here to preach in the conference I was also speaking in and spoke to us. He's a great man of God. But I'd never heard of him before. So we, I mentioned where I had been in Jamaica preaching. I said, I was up in Paradise, Norwood. He said, that's where I was born. That's where I'm from. That's my home. Right on top of the mountain up from Montego Bay. And he said, as he was leaving, he said, this man is amazing. He preached where I lived, where I was born, up there on top of the mountain in that one specific small place. And then now he also lived in the town where I have my church now in America. How small a world is this? How amazing is that? But he said Jamaica has the most churches, the point is, the most churches per square meter or mile or whatever than anywhere on the planet. He says you could look it up. Thousands and thousands of churches across a small island all crammed together. But how many of them are really making the impact? You know, how, let, let me tell you something. How, how far can you go? How disciplined can you be? How much can you pay the price? The message of the Lord came forth through Dr. Paul Inenche this, this two days. We were together a couple days back. He said, the price of revival, the need for revival, our need for revival. I've also preached on this. How hungry are you for revival? Catherine Kuhlman said, you can have anything I have, any level of anointing, anything you see if you can pay the price. This is, that disqual this is what disqualifies most everybody. You want financial reward. The Lord spoke to me too also about the tithe factor. He says, when you're tithing, notice more money flows in your life. I said, yeah. He said, a lot more will flow. Sometimes we block our own breakthrough by not doing the things of, that are written here. We knew about it, but we still didn't do it. Somebody based on their trial, their laziness, or their own head, or they think, I'm still alive, I got away with it, I can do that, and then like lightning didn't strike, so I, I just, I, it's kind of okay. No, it's not okay. If you know the principle in the scripture says, if you tithe, I'll open up the windows of heaven, but if you don't, a, a curse is added to your financial life. If God says you're cursed with a curse, a curse is added to you, let's say that part of your life. That, that also means you can just deduce from that, deduct from that, or figure, that, figure out from that, that he's also not going to promote you and add to you, because you're not obedient. You know, there's another slant I want to say on Isaiah 119. Let's look at that. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. No, but then he said the 20th verse, but if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured. But the tithe rebuked the devourer. It's the same word. Are you seeing that? Mercy. <laughs> Are you seeing that? Kora shala kala seko chala niya. Thank you, Lord, for this teaching here today. I'm a teacher. I'm a prophet. Yes, I'm a prophet to the nations. I, we prophesy amazing things. The Lord speaks through me. Many, many amazing things. But I am in the office of a teacher. I would guess you'd say a good pastor, because a good pastor should always be a good teacher. But a teacher is not always a pastor. There is the office of the teacher. There's prophet and teacher. Remember Acts 13. Separate from me Saul and Barnabas for the purpose which I've commanded them to, 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 to walk in. And he said there were certain ones separated, prophets and teachers. I'll tell you, we need teachers in the church today. A lot of things I've shared here, you won't get in your Sunday uh, you know, noisy, explosive, exciting music, dance, drama, song, message to whatever it is about some Bible story and then some other pontifications, that declarations or whatever, for you know, my breakthrough or whatever it is, or miracles or whatever, whatever it's talked about. But to, to teach doctrine from the Holy Word of God, the mind of God, the plan of action for how he would elevate our life to a higher place. You know, you don't hear that everywhere. I'm very, very honored and privileged, Lord, to be this vessel. 
I, 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 I don't, you know, I'm not going to scream and dance and shout and shake, you know, like some people do to make noise and get people excited. But why? I'm also happy about that because we need teaching. Archbishop Harrison Nung, I was talking about the, the, the apostle, the bishop from Jamaica that I was just mentioning. He says, this man is, is, is amazing, like shout Jesus seven times and, you know, run around and do all this, you know. He's, he's like, wow. He said, some of us, he said, it's like gym. He said, it's like, like you're going to the gym. He said, me, I'm not like a gymnast. I, I'm me. I'm in my lane. I flow. I teach. I speak. I don't. You see, Archbishop Harrison, he'll stand behind the pulpit, the camera's on, and he doesn't walk around. Uh, he'll come out to pray for people and lay hands on people when he's done, but while he's teaching and speaking, he'll stay right there. That's his flow. That's his operation. You say that's not good, not exciting enough, not making enough noise, not shouting, not dancing, not jumping. What? Hey, well, look at him. He's extremely successful. In fact, he's commanded the audiences of more multitudes of people than all these dancing, jumping preachers combined. Yes or yes. It's a fact. Do the research. Look at it. Archbishop Harrison K. Nanga, N-G apostrophe A-N-G apostrophe A, is how you say his name. Spell it. He has the largest church in the capital city of Kenya, Nairobi, the largest in attendance. Now they're busting out the walls to, for the church. He's at capacity crowd of 12,000 people in attendance on Sunday. And that, to my knowledge, is the biggest church in the land at this point. But I, the Lord had me prophesy that this is going to be the day of mega churches rising in the nation of Kenya. But it's going to be through these people that I'm talking about that are following, or at least they're trying with all their heart and mind and, and action and obedience to follow the plan of God that he can elevate such a one. It's not going to be for everybody. It's going to be the ones who are obedient. Now, again, Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you don't, you won't. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You'll be devoured. Wondering about devouring, the devouration, if I can make a word, the, de the devouring that's been happening in your world. Why? Because you didn't tithe. Repent today and tithe. When you get 10,000, take that 1,000 and put it aside. When you get 1,000, take that 100 and put it aside. And sow it into the storehouse. Plant, I mean, pay it into the storehouse. Then you want to sow beyond that, now it's seed. Dr. Jesse Duplantis, who's a great teacher on uh, many things. He's really an evangelist. But when he gets into the flow of talking about the, the laws of prosperity and money and all that, he's, because he's so rich, he's so blessed. He said the best return he's seen on any financial giving is on the seed. Not the first fruits, not the alms, giving outreach, giving to the poor. You lend to the Lord, the Lord will repay. That's even for even. I used to think, God, I used to say, even say this. I, I used to... I used to even say this and I had to correct myself. I say, like, what you give, God will never give back the way, the way, to you the way you gave it. Well, I'm adding that. It sounds good. It's, it's emotional. It seems like because God's a giver, he's generous. And maybe he will do more things for you than you did for him. But in the realm of giving to the poor, the Lord says he will repay. He didn't say he will increase. Doesn't say that. It's not the word that's used there. He will repay you. So if I give $1,000 to help the poor, rest assured, be assured, I'm getting $1,000 back from God. Is he going to add to it another blessing? I hope so. I believe so. That's his nature to bless. But scripturally, I will repay. Repay. Pay. Not increase harvest multiplied. Repay means I pay back is exactly what was given. That's what the word means, and that's what's there. So let's be literal. Let's, let's be let's be literal. Let's be realistic about it. But Dr. Jesse Duplantis, who's worth listening to, he said, 
The biggest thing I've seen is the seed. Jesus even said 30, 60, 100 fold return, which means times what you gave, not percentage of increase, 30% return, 60% return. No, 30 times what you gave, 60 times what you gave, 100 times or 100 fold what you gave. Dr. Jerry Savelle just went to be with the Lord. Great teacher of the word also, a man of faith, a teacher of faith, teacher of prosperity and financial principles also. He said he learned something about the hundredfold. It doesn't just mean a hundred of what you gave. He said he found in the word, in studying the depth of the original word of a hundredfold, meaning even better quality than what you gave. It's in there. So that's on the seed. That's more than the tithe. The tithe said, rebuke the devourer, open up the windows of heaven and stop pouring you out blessing. Now that's a lot. That's good. And making you a delightsome land for him. Those three things. Okay? But the seed, 30, 60, 100 fold. What you're sowing. And I have to say this again. Scripturally speaking, as a literalist, as a realist, from the Bible, exactly saying, teaching of what it says. You are not a seed sower until you are first a tither. Whatever you give out is being recorded by the angels up to the 10% as tithe. Do they have the right to do that? Yes. God and his angels are supreme. They're his, they're his ministers. They're his executives. They're his officers. They have the right to account to him for anything that goes on on the earth. That's their right. Oh, yes. You're learning something here? So up to the 10%, until you've given the 10%, you haven't fully tithed. Once you're fully tithed, now God says, oh, Lord, sow away, sow away, let's sow. Someone may say, I, I, I don't understand that. Well, you mean if I give to somebody something, it's not a seed? No, because he commands us to tithe. The tithe is first. If you want to debate that, argue with that, again, as I said before, have at it. Do what you want, but suffer the consequences. I'm teaching you, you want to get blessed? Then you got to do things right. If you didn't do things right before, don't cry about it forever. Repent today and say, Lord, help me, help me. Give me your grace. Keep it in my mind that I'll push myself. Even if I feel it's inconvenient, you say, how am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to survive? Just go out of your way and tithe. Believe God to do what he said and open up the windows of heaven and bless you. And there's something that would like steal from your treasuries Hit the devourer, that devil, will, is rebuked and he won't be able to, uh, to take your stuff. I could share a lot of testimonies. For time's sake, I won't, but right now, but in future days, I will share some of them. Of the blessings of the Lord, making someone rich and adding no sorrow and bless, just blessing that came because we're in the will of God. Number one is diligence. Uh, based on what? On the, vision and, on the vision that God's given. Passionately, you're obsessed with it. You, you, you can't stop doing it. You just, you're just consumed and obsessed and possessed by it. Let's lift our hands. Father, I thank you for this. Hmm. Yeah, Lord, I'll say it. Promotion, he says, doesn't come from the north, south, east, or the west. I think it, said it talks about the north or the south. Or the south or from man. It doesn't say all east, west. It says two of them in the scripture, if I remember correctly. That be in Psalm 75. Let's try to look at that later. It might be in Psalm 75. Someone could find that for me. If it's Psalm 75. Psalm 75. Someone could find that for me. If it's Psalm 75. Leading to that in my mind, but I'm not sure at the moment. I don't have the reference in front of me. But the scripture talks about promotion doesn't come from here or there. It comes from the Lord. 
So if you want God to promote you and bless you and lift you up, you've got to do things His way. Sounds like a big challenge, but really it's not because His grace is sufficient for us. His grace will help us do the things He's ordained. And guess what? Father knows best. When He... Um, when he, when he um, says he wants to bless us, he gives us an instruction. And he'll honor us for being obedient to that very instruction. I want to challenge everybody that doesn't have this book. You can get a copy by texting the WhatsApping, please, or text messaging from around the world the word book to plus 254 706-164-191. The number will be on the screen. And uh, this is also available in digital format if you'd like to get it around the world in digital. Request it. I can send it to you. And it's really my gift to those that sow a seed into this anointing, a generous seed. This will be my gift to you. If you want to buy it, per se, this says, the scripture says, buy the truth and sell it not. I don't sell anything. I just give out all that I have, and God takes care of the rest. I don't look for money. Money looks for me. I don't look for blessing. Blessing looks for me. I, I receive provision from the Lord because he's good like that, because I'm working for him. I want to challenge everybody again. Work more for God in this season than you ever have. Get more passionate and diligent. Another book's coming out in a reprinted, expanded edition, The Laws of Success. Very powerful. Uh, another prophecy book is also ready with prophecies for a particular nation. The Focus Factor... Success strategies, we're working on the reprint of those. These are all sold out. The Benefits of Excellence is also available in digital format. So these three, the Laws of Success, the Benefits of Excellence, are available. They're ready right now to send as digital copies if you're a partner of the ministry. Sowing into this grace, as I've been teaching, tithe, sow seed, be generous. Proverbs 11.25, put it on the screen, says, the, the, the generous person, I like the version where it says it like this. I think it's the New Living Translation or one of those. It's not King James or New King James. It's a different one. More of a modern English translation. It says, um, the generous one will become like a well-watered garden. Would you like that to be your testimony? Great teachings on the subject of excellence and the subjects of success in these two books. And of course, this is also available as a digital copy if you'd like to get it from anywhere. This is for partners only. Now, there's a way you could purchase it and get it and all that. And uh, we're also going to put them on Amazon. We're going to do all that. Uh, that's being done. But uh, you could just get it like that. No problem. Do it the way you want, but to our partners, I cherish your relationship and connection with me, and I want to sow the word into your life. So you're sowing into the anointing and receiving harvest back from that. You're tithing. You're opening up the windows of heaven for yourself by doing that. Uh, and I'm sowing the word into you. So there's no purchase transaction. I really prefer it like that. I like to do things for our ministry partners. If you're a ministry partner from far away, you'd like to get the digital copy of this, please ask me. And if I didn't, if I'm, bit, I'm, I'm a bit busy, to say the least, but keep, remind me again and keep after me. I will make sure we get it to you, okay? Also, we're, we're intaking people that are brilliant into our organization to help in the realms of administration, the realm of media, and uh, those things like that. And if you'd like to be a part of our work, then just tell me, send a, get a message to me. Just WhatsApp me a message from around the world. You know the WhatsApp software. WhatsApp. Some people call it WhatsApp. I correct them. It's not WhatsApp. Hey, what's up? No, no, I like that, but it's WhatsApp. 
W-H-A-T-S-A-P-P, WhatsApp, to this number, plus 254-706-164191. We also have a toll-free line in America, 1-747-26-FAITH, which is 32484. 26 Three two four eight four, area code plus two, plus one the American one, and area code seven four seven two six faith. That'll be on the screen. Let's put it on that we have put it before. Let's make a tag for that. It's a free call to you in America. It's a voicemail only. It doesn't ring anywhere. It's a computer line. So if you'd like to be live in communication with me, I would suggest you use the WhatsApp from anywhere in the world, plus 254-706-164191. Uh, also, you can join our, uh, uh, on our website to get our free e-news, okay, by signing up there on thomasmanton.com, T-H-O-M-A-S-M-A-N-T-O-N.com. And you want to sew, you can sew by PayPal. Let's put that up on the screen. And cash app, paypal.me forward sign Thomas Manton. Or cash app.me forward sign at, uh, no, excuse me, dollar sign Dr. Thomas Manton. Dr. Thomas Manton. It's a little bit longer. Cash.me forward sign dollar sign Dr. Thomas Manton. PayPal is easier, and I prefer PayPal. By the way, PayPal is better because it's around the world. Cash App is an American thing. Some people like their Cash App, but Cash App has gone through some uh, disputes from men of God who say they're holding the money, and they, they're making these regulations about releasing the funds uh, in increments, and it's annoying some dear apostle friends of mine in America so some have taken the Cash App thing totally off their giving uh, platforms and they're not going to use Cash App anymore, which is going to be very uh, a costly loss to the, the Square company, the Cash App, who has Cash App. People in Africa, you don't even know what Cash App is. What are you talking about? I, it's an American thing. By the way, on the internet, it doesn't even work outside. So forget it. There's also World Remit. And SendWave, which you could use from around the world that goes to the app that goes right, sends the money right to the phone by the M-Pesa system, which was originated in Kenya. I heard that the man from uh, Facebook, uh, Meta, came to buy, tried to buy it out, and it was, it was refused and turned away. Uh, it's a brilliant money system that you can send money right to the phone. Uh, if you, you're around, you know the, uh, locally, you know the M-Pesa Number, use that 0706, that one you don't need the area code, Z locally, 0706-164191. Send your tithe, your offering, your seed, your alms, or your first fruits directly to M-Pesa. And they've upped the limit. Somebody said, well, I can't send that much money. Yeah, you could send 150,000 shillings at a time. And you could, I, no. Even from the app, they come through more. I, had, I saw one come through for over 200,000 shillings. So don't think, ah, it's limited. I, it used to be 70,000. You got all these limits in your head. They've changed it. In fact, the M-Pesa could take half a million shillings a day, 500,000 per day in transactions. So don't think it's going to choke and you can't send a big amount. You can do, use that. It's a good way to do it. PayPal is brilliant because it's on the online system and it's all the nations are using it. PayPal.me, let's put it up again. PayPal.me forward sign Thomas Manton. I really like that uh, uh, modality. I like that app. I like that uh, function. It helps, it helps the work of God a lot. Use PayPal, my friend. PayPal, PayPal. If you want to do the old way of Western Union or MoneyGram, you could also use those. And there's a way that uh, from Ghana, they, we, they called it Momo. Momo is a funny word. Anyway, it's a, it's a system of m meaning money. Mo, mo for money. Uh, a system, it doesn't work internationally. It's really a, Ghana, a Ghanaian thing in Ghana. 
can you, can you get it from the Momo? I was like, no, the Momo doesn't go outside of Ghana. I don't think it doesn't work. Momo doesn't work. So just Western Union or MoneyGram, the money, okay, ask me for the details. Thomas Manton is the name and then the place. And then you got to put your uh, formal name that's on your ID. It's all of that. Uh, talk to us and we communicate about it. We'll tell you how, how, how to send. Then there's a, a reference number you can send after the transaction is done so we can do that. That's a very antiquated system. PayPal, you don't need any of that. It just goes right from your card to your PayPal account, account right to the thing. If you want to do the old-fashioned way on PayPal without the .me, you want to just go into the PayPal app. The, the, the email to use is ministry at thomasmanton.com. Let's put that on the screen. Ministry at, M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y, at thomasmanton.com. Ministry at thomasmanton.com is the way to uh, send it just through the direct app. If you want to find, you'll find my profile inside there. A direct link right to the page. It's easier, even easier than that is paypal.me forward sign Thomas Manton. It's so simple. And you use your card or your PayPal account, click to send, boom. Everybody do those in huge numbers. No limit. I love you for it. It helps the mission that we're on in Jesus' name. And PESA, again, locally is 0706164191. If you want to use SendWave or World Remit from outside the country, you download those apps, the SendWave app or the World Remit app. I think in South Africa, people like World Remit a bit more. I've seen it, uh, that. But uh, from America, SendWave is good. Or World Remit. And you uh, do it to plus 254-706-164-191. All right. I'm glad I had the energy and uh, grace to share that at length. That you can know how to sow into this ministry. We we'll take this clip and also share this out to other people that just want to be partners. We could send you this. These are the ways you can give and tithe and sow, tithe, give and sow into this anointing and into this work of God right here. I very much appreciate you becoming my partner. You say, who is a partner of your ministry, Dr. Thomas Manton IV? Somebody who's sowing regularly into the vision. I consider you a partner. You're automatically a partner. I don't have to make some new designation or have some official anointing service for that. You are a partner when you're supporting the work, and now you're going to have the benefits of being a partner. I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. I'm lifting you up in your knees before the Lord. And by the way, I'll say this. I'm a worker. You could send me 24 hours a day on WhatsApp. Don't ring the phone because there are different times events I'm in. The ringer may not work. But you can WhatsApp a message to me 24-7, 365, without limit. As much as you want to say, as much as you want to talk about your prayer requests, what's going on, even testimonies, I welcome those. There's no limit to how much you can do that. Now, if I see somebody write me 17 times a day and they're saying the same thing, I'm going to wonder if they're okay up here. I'll pray for maybe some mental deliverance for you. You, you get me. I'm joking. But, but, you know, I tell people, don't feel bad about sending me. It's a 24-hour world now. It used to be like after 9 o'clock p.m., you know, you have this thing, don't call anybody. Well, that's okay if you're going to ring their phone. Somebody said to me yesterday, like, I'll call them in the morning. I said, no, I want to talk to them now. So I hung up and called them. They answered the phone. They were right there. They were wide awake. It was 11.15 p.m. So what? Ready to take the call. We talk. We solve the whole thing for the next day. Done. I, don't, I can't wait till tomorrow to, to, for what needs to be done today. We, we've entered a 24-hour world. Now, this thing about people go to bed at 10 o'clock. You don't want to ring their phone at 10. I understand that. Yay. Okay. But some people, it doesn't apply to them. They're up. You think someone's already asleep? No, they're not. Many people aren't these days. Things have changed in the world a bit. 
The Lord really challenged me, by the way. I'll, I'll balance it on the other side with this, with this story. The Lord really challenged me. I wrote, I wrote to a man of God at like 2 o'clock in the morning because that's my, that's my normal thing. And I think he got alerted by the call and I felt really bad. I felt convicted. I thought, oh, with him, I'm only going to write him during business hours because his schedule is so intense. Major leader, major uh, covenant relationship I have. I respect him so highly. He's a very busy man. I wouldn't be ringing his phone at midnight. He's probably asleep because he's got a heavy schedule next day. I, so that's a balance to that rule. So I thought, him, if I'm writing him a message, even on WhatsApp, or to communicate, I'm going to do it in the parameters of the business day. It's preferably between 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. Out of respect for him. But that's it. All the people you think they're already asleep, they may not be. Try to call them. Get it done. We're in a 24-hour world. I've been having this dialogue back and forth with the West Coast of America, which is 10 hours uh, earlier than us and um, you know they're writing all night back and forth you know it's late it's the middle of the night their time they're still up they're on my page they're studying my materials we're, we're, we're doing business we're doing things together so it's like it's it's a 24-hour world so I challenge you again to say this please make use of my phone number make use of relationship but become a partner And then, you know, there's people that always have to write about some evil thing they're going through. And I wonder if there's a root cause to all of that because they're just not a giver. Be a giver. Sow a seed, man. Woman. Sow a seed. Light up my m -Pesa. Light it up. Light up my PayPal. Let me see your name there. And when I, when I just see your name, I'll smile. Not based on the factor of money alone, but the fact that you take it seriously to sow into this vision. I'll consider you an elite member of my circle in my world. Hello? Father, I thank you for your blessing that makes rich and has no sorrow upon every giver and every partner. And those of you that have given before, and you've been so generous to this work, I cherish you beyond words the harvest is yet coming be encouraged everything you did was not lost it was not forgotten it can never be forgotten it's an eternal memorial and legacy it's seed that will yet produce harvest that are yet unseen whatever the struggle is whatever's gone on between here and there so many people in our day have gone through economic crisis i can even think of people that have been uh, covenant partners with us and they've gone through some things you know because of just the way the world is the way the economy is gone it's going to spin back around those billion deals are for you i prophesy in jesus name lift your hands those big big things of breakthroughs are for you they're not diverted they're not averted no we don't accept that well i just have to make it on this and it looks like this is the way no that doesn't look like anything how it's going to be the abundance of God is always beyond what you see in the natural. The big thing is yet ahead. It's still there. It's still possible. You, you're the one that can't quit in your faith believing for it to happen because it will happen. And I prophesy and declare over every partner, every connected covenant person with me that's connected with me spiritually and in this work of God. The Lord's going to make people be good to you in these coming days. The Lord is going to make people favor you and honor you in these coming days. You're going to begin to see people helping you with things you didn't get helped in before. You're going to see favor coming. It's elevation into financial abundance. It's really going to happen. I'm reminded, Lord, of the, the, mess, the series you had me do, 66 full messages teachings, an hour long each on some of them more, on the subject, the money is coming. And the Lord said to me one day, he said, you think I was kidding? You think I was joking? Because sometimes it looks like 
you're, you're in trials and tribulations and warfares and obstacles and limitations, things, you know, things that have just tried to block the way. But did not the Lord speak? Did he already say that wealth was being transferred? Did he already say that abundance was coming? Did he already say that money? He said it. This was prophetic, thus saith the Lord. So guess what? Does he tell stories? No. Did he tell stories? When I wrote in my books on the laws of success and, and ways to break through in life, what, what, I, inspired by the Holy Ghost, was I joking when I wrote those things? Was it like, oh, you know, optional, well, maybe, maybe not. No! Absolutely must happen. When he wrote these promises to us in this great book, the Holy Bible, was he joking? No. It will come to pass. Father, I thank you for the touch of heaven, the anointing of fire for financial abundance and breakthrough in the life of my precious friend who's listening to me right now. Be blessed. I'll be back on the next broadcast. I love you so much. I'm praying for you. This has been Divine Formulas for Financial Abundance. One part of it. I've shared a lot, but there's more in the source factory of this ocean of revelation. Get ready for the next one. In Jesus' name, I love you. I'm praying for you. Now, I, now like I said, I want to hear from you. Again, let's put the phone number up on the screen. I, and we'll have a, 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 an outro at the end of this message where you could see ways to connect with the ministry. I want to hear from you, waiting to hear from you, and I'll be praying for you after you've written to me. After you've sown, tithe, done all the, all the necessaries that you need to do for God's goodness to begin to overflow your life in, better, in more and better ways than you've seen before. And I'm going to keep you very close to my heart, praying before the Lord for God to give you great financial abundance and increase in this day and hour. In Jesus' name. I'm Thomas Manton IV. God bless you. I love you. Talk to you on the next one. Bye-bye.